All right. So just wanted to start out tonight by giving you a little bit of background on this program and a few thank yous that I, it's really important, I think, to us and for everyone in the community that we all are knowledgeable about how this grant program came to be. Um, it's something that EC3 has been working on actually since about 2017, and it's started out with a report that we did in collaboration with the Precarious Festival that Kate Story uh, organizes and with uh, the Trent Center for Community Research. We did a report on the status of the artist, um, taking a look at how much money people in Peterborough made through their art practice, their living conditions, their educational background, uh, what kind of resources were available. And this was followed up by a couple of panel discussions in subsequent years at Precarious that were jointly produced by Precarious and EC3. And it you know, really was obvious probably to most of us in the arts, but we needed to have some information and some data to press our case with the city for funding for grants for individual artists. So this is the first year where this program has existed with this name. But I can tell you that in the during COVID, we were able to repurpose some Arts Week money. And essentially, this program is the very same, if not exactly the same, very close to the Arts Week Shift 2 program that we did last year. So this is a somewhat of a classic grants to individual artists program. The thing that's a bit different about it in a great way is that we've revived an older tradition and created a program of grants that's component one at $1,500, which is really directed towards artists to um, develop their practice, their research, their thinking, um, anything that they think is important to the development of their artwork. And you don't have to have a particular project or outcome or a presentation to the public. Um, that will be at the end of it. So that's component one. That was part of Arts Week Shift 2, and we got very, very strong and positive feedback about that program, and the city seemed to welcome it. Um, the city is contributing to the cost of this, pro this program, and EC3 has added additional funds to it. Um, and as I have been saying to you, it has two components. So we'll talk about component one first. These are the mini development grants for individual professional artists. So the key here, I think, for people to take home is that it's a small amount of money that you can use any way you want to develop your, pro your practice, uh, to advance your practice, to do something different in your practice. You can pay your rent with it for a couple of months and take time off to do research or develop sketches or workshop a play that you have, finish writing that last bit of the novel. Um, in our last um, go round when it was under the banner of Arts Week Shift 2, some people used the money to work, work with experts, people who they wanted to um, give them master classes or to, to be their mentors. Some people took um, professional development classes here outside of Peterborough. The focus in writing this grant application for component one is really to explain what you're doing in your practice as an artist and how you'll use the money to develop or advance that practice. You don't have to have a project at the end of it. You can, and that's great, but you don't have to. We really believe that it's important to support artists in the phase when they're researching and developing things, when they're um, in that creative and experimental stage, just like you would uh, in a science project or a, a small business. So $1,500 to, to do whatever you think is the best investment for your practice and your discipline, or if you're moving to a new discipline. You do have to be a professional artist, and we'll get to the definition of professional artist a little bit later, but essentially you have to have completed your, your schooling and your education in whatever form that has taken place, and you have to have a track record of exhibition. 
um, um, at least within your community and being paid for your work and being a professional artist is the main focus of, of what you're trying to do, even if you haven't been able to work full time as an artist, which in Peterborough is pretty challenging. Um, you can be working in any form of art practice and or discipline, music, visual arts, media arts, writing, literary, performance, theater, dance. You can be a composer, a performer, um, a director, an actor, and you can be working in a cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, or interdisciplinary practice. If you want me to define those, please feel free to ask me the question later on. And um, it's very important to note that we're trying to welcome proposals from um, the Real Cultural Diversity of Peterborough and Canada today. And we welcome applications from artists and equity seeking communities. So for us, that would mean um, BIPOC artists, L 2S LGBTQ plus artists, and artists with who identify as having disabilities, being deaf or hard of hearing, or who are marginalized in any way by income or by uh, health issues. You can always call us and ask for accommodation and support on preparing your application. We'll do everything we can to help you. Thanks, Gabe. So here are just some ideas of what can happen in component one. These are the things that we've seen come in. They were eligible and they received grants. The development of new projects or ideas, research and experimentation. Advancing existing works, but there's still works in progress and you know you need to move them forward in some way. If you're transitioning to a new discipline or a new medium that you're, you know, maybe that you've worked in the visual arts, but you want to make your first video and you need to have time or some support in going from um, visual arts to video or from writing to video, you could apply for funding to help support that kind of transition. Um, advancing skills and knowledge to build or strengthen work that could be professional development, um, either in person professional development or taking online courses or attending workshops. I, for example, I know Denise Fujiwara is here this weekend. Is it this weekend? Yeah, this weekend doing a, um, no, uh, no, it's the 26th doing a, um, a dance workshop, anything that you can argue to a jury of your peers will advance your skills and knowledge in a way that will develop your practice. You can adapt existing works um, or develop new approaches to creating and producing your work. So we did have a lot of people that wanted assistance to move their work and their practice into um, the digital realm. That's certainly eligible, the use of new technologies, but anything that you thought you wanted to do to adapt an existing work. So again, that could be going from, from a poem to a video, from going to spoken word poetry to the written word, um, anything that involves a transition of an existing work or a development of an existing work in a new way to creating and producing than the one you've typically been using. Okay. okay. So I'm just going to pause for a minute because now we're going into component two. Are there questions about component one, the open ended mini grant at $1,500? Not seeing any hands. Everybody's clear on that one? Okay. Component two is much more outcome focused. It's a project production and presentation grant um, specifically for individual professional artists. So in this case, it provides up to $3,500 to the artist for creation, production and presentation of new projects or works in progress. Again, it can be in any artistic uh, discipline that can take place virtually or live in Peterborough, but we would um, expect the project to be delivered in the next two years. And final reporting would be um, required in line with that two year window. 
Projects can include works in, again, any discipline or combination of disciplines in any form, any location in the city or county, including Curve Lake and Hiawatha First Nations. It can be from new, new or established indoor venues, outdoor spaces, mobile activities, broadcast banners, billboard publications, or virtual projects, social media projects. Really, any discipline that you want to work in and any way that you want to get the work out to audiences, whether it's a traditional performance piece within a theater or a bar, or whether it's something new that you're trying, like broadcast or social media. Some people, the grant will, will make the most sense if it goes to the individual, but they might want to be working as part of a collective, an ad hoc group, or with an established arts organization. So say you're planning on developing a work with your collective, but it's, it's essentially your work, you're the driving force, but you're doing it within the context of, of your collective, that's fine. Or maybe you've been offered an opportunity to do something at TTOK or art space. The grant goes to you to help drive the project and shape it the way you want it to be shaped and to be used the way you think it should be used in terms of um, you know, creating the final product. Thanks, Gabe. I think um, another thing I wanted to just emphasize is, is in terms of these projects, you can step outside the box. If you want the final project to be a series of pop-ups or a durational reading or a, a series, whoops, there we go, um, or something that runs continuously in a window space, something like that, all of those things are eligible. The grant will go to you, but if you're working with other artists, you have to pay the other artists artists fees. And that's between you and the artist to settle up how much money that would be, but we can help you sort that out by referring you to organizations that set fees for different artists. So the Writers Union, CARFAC, uh, Actors Equity, um, a number of organizations like that. Um, and again, we really want to welcome uh, projects from the cultural diversity of Peterborough and Canada Day and artists in equity seeking communities. If anybody needs help with their application, we're happy to do that. Please get in touch with us. Thanks, Gabe. So here's the kind of basic eligibility criteria to be eligible in the program. You have to be a Canadian citizen, have permanent resident status, or be a person upon whom, upon whom refugee protection has been conferred and are legally entitled to work in Ontario. So that's, I'm um, happy to say that's a much broader category than we've had before. We've been working with the Centre for New Canadians to um, establish those parameters. You have to be able to show a permanent address in Peterborough City or in the county, including Curve Lake and Hiawatha First Nations. You have to be 18 or older. You have to have completed, and this is pretty common in most arts councils, and submitted any and all outstanding reports from previous EC3 grants. If you haven't yet, don't panic. Just get in touch with us and we'll figure out what you need to do to bring your reports up to date. And student projects and full-time students are not eligible for the program. Um, the definition of prof professional artists, I think I'll go over that again. And Gabe, I think it's gonna be on the next slide. Uh, we actually don't have that on the slide. Okay, so yeah. I'll, I'll just go over it verbally again. Uh, a professional artist is someone who's completed and they're, um, studies, they're working actively as a professional artist, they get paid for their work whenever possible, they have a history and track record of public exhibition within their own, own community or, or a broader community, and they're making every effort to establish themselves as a professional artist as their primary um, employment and career path. 
it's spelled out for sure in the application form. So a number of times in the last few years, we've had artists come in um, with projects where they want to work with what the province defines as vulnerable communities, minors, those living with mental illness, economic disadvantage, um, brain injuries, things like that. Sometimes the groups that you may be working with will require this, but EC3 and the OAC are making this a pretty regular um, requirement is uh, we'll take a look at the application and and if necessary we would ask for you to get a police vulnerable sector check um, which doesn't cost very much money and we will cover that separately from the grant that you're given um, Gabe you're more of the expert on this than I am do you want to add anything um there's not much to add really it, it is it's yeah it's a pretty standard check uh, a lot of people who who apply for who have these kind of project ideas are doing so they're they're already working with with an organization and they've already passed the check like this in which case it's fine if we just have proof uh, that the participant has passed the check uh, also it's worth noting that just these kinds of checks do pop up with with a lot of stuff and just because there's something on your check they, they look at a lot of different databases and things like that and just because there's you know a, a, a something completely minor that doesn't matter that that comes up on the check that doesn't necessarily mean uh you're you're disqualified from a grant um it will be it'll be reviewed by the ec3 board uh, or by a committee uh, and a decision will be made um and then grants grant funds will be released um and again the the checks i believe are about 40 dollars but if that is in any way a barrier to anyone just please let us know and, and we can cover that cost okay Thanks, Gabe. I think we're ready for the next slide. So you fill out your grant application. It'll be, it'll go to Gabe first, and he registers all the applications and does the first review of them to see if the eligibility uh, criteria have been met. If there are questions or issues, he and I will talk about it and we will uh, follow up with you if there are um, eligibility issues that we really think are borderline, then we'll bring them to the jury uh, for a decision on whether they're eligible or not. But we like to be able to um, make a final decision about eligibility before things go to the jury. Um, it's our job to make sure the eligibility requirements are pretty clear and transparent and clinical, because the most important part of the assessment process is when your application comes in front of a peer assessment committee. Um, in the case of grants to individual artists, the peer assessment committee language and jury are the same thing. Because they're grants to individuals, the um, recommendation of the jury is final. Uh, we would not uh, we would not tamper with um, not tamper is the wrong word, but we don't adjust the funding after the jury has made a decision. Um, often, though, the jury will um, feel compelled to fund a certain project, but there isn't quite enough money and they might reduce the amount that you asked for a little bit in order to fund something that they're really passionate about. There's a very formal process that the jury peer assessment committee goes through. Um, they receive the applications well in advance. They're expected to have read all of the applications in advance. And we develop um, a matrix of the um, assessment criteria, which you'll see in a minute. And, and they have to provide numbers for that. And we put in the, the numbers, what their evaluation numbers are at the very beginning. And then we enter into a discussion, a very serious discussion process about why each juror has um, ranked um, or graded each application the way they have and each criteria the way they have. Um, they go through that process. They get a ranking from like one to, let's say there are 40 applications. And it's only at the end that we tell the jury how much money is available and we show them what they could fund with the money that is available. 
And again, this is a pretty standard practice that every public arts council in the country, whether it's the Canada Council or Provincial Arts Council um, uses, and it's the one that auditors think is the most transparent and um, fair and democratic. Um, EC3 staff does not have a role in assessing or ranking the applications. Our role is to make sure that the process of assessment is fair and equitable and follows all the rules that everyone who's on the assessment panel or the jury um, has a fair and reasonable um, opportunity to speak and that the criteria and priorities of the program are interwoven in their discussion. And we're really hoping to move all of this along quickly because uh, we'll get the results out to you on August 2nd. We, we had hoped we would have more time for the application process, but this is a election year, municipal election year, and it's I call it silly season. So there's just this huge rush to get everything done in August so that council can approve in September. And as this is unfortunately been designated a pilot project, we have to get our report in, in in August. And if we have good applications and good projects, and I'm sure we will, it'll be made a permanent program um, by council in September. And we really want it to go in front of this council because it's a pretty arts positive council. And then if the program is, if your application, I mean, is successful, we'll send you a letter of agreement, just confirming how much money, when the checks will come, um, what the reporting requirements are, and we usually put in something about how to thank EC3 in the city of Peterborough in your documents, or if you're making a film in your credits, or um, any of the final productions. Okay. We're going back to component one now, so that's the open-ended um, mini-grant. How will you be evaluated on the quality and clarity of your artist statement? Well, that's you know where it can be really valuable to get somebody else to take a look at what you've written and just ask them, would this convince you to give me a grant? And it's where you tell your story. What, what have you been doing in your artistic practice to date? What's been important to you? What achievements have you made? And what will you do with the money that you get? Whatever you decide to do with it, how will it advance or enhance or develop your personal practice as an artist? Why would you want the money to do what you're proposing at this time? What do you, difference do you think it might have? What difference might it make? We had um, an, another applicant who, you know, was really straightforward that they had a full-time job and two small children and they were gonna be able to either get childcare or pull back a little bit from the job for a month or so and concentrate on finishing some songwriting and then hand, actually handing in the songs that they wrote to the for an Ontario Arts Council grant. That's a perfectly decent proposal and the um, support material was very persuasive and the jury awarded the grant. The second piece is the artistic merit of the program of activities and how they'll be of value for your artist practice. That's the jury will be specifically asked, how do you feel about the artistic merit of, the, of this artist's um, work to date? And that will be defined from your support material that you provide. And the feasibility of the proposed plan of activities, which usually um, is pretty reasonable. Just does the funding, is the funding request believable? in terms of what the person's hoping to accomplish. And if we look at your resume or your bio, do we have reason to believe from your past experience that you could actually do this? The jury will be composed of people that include emerging um, uh, senior and mid-career artists. And we will have people from different disciplines. Um, we try to wait um, to put the jury together until all the applications are in and we can assess what we call the landscape of the um, 
application pool so that everybody will have at least someone that we think you would think know, would know and understand your work. We usually have juries of five people, so it can be quite a lot of work between conflict of interest and, and other things to uh, get a jury that can do that, but so far so good. Thanks, Gabe. Component two, there's a little bit more um, emphasis on the particular artist statement and the project description, the merit of the program of activities. And this is where um, project feasibility is more important or, than in component one. On uh, component one, you don't really have to provide a budget. You just have to say how much money you want. Only provide a budget if you're gonna be bringing other people into the work. but. Um, I think the jury will really want to see if you're proposing a big production that you're going to get $3,500 from EC3's Grants for Individual Artists program, and you have a private donor who's giving $1,000, and you think ticket sales will be this much. And um, the budget is way, way important in component two. I see. Um, before we move on, um, I think there's a question in the chat, so I just want to highlight that uh, from Margot Can, um, kind of on the, the eligibility and professional artist question. I have a question. I haven't gone to formal art school, but I've been selling my paintings for close to four years. Would I be considered a professional artist? Uh, Margo, it doesn't matter if you've gone to school, as long as you've been working as a professional exhibiting your work in um, a, a public setting um, and being paid for your work if you've been selling. Um, you don't have to have training in a, in a fine arts program or have gone to art college or anything like that. You can't be a student currently registered in a program, though. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Go back to the chat here. Okay. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah, Margo, if you have any follow-up, just feel free to put those in the chat as well. And uh, Heidi Wheatung asks, what if it isn't your primary income? Well, I think there are very few artists in Peterborough where it is their primary income, Heidi. So don't worry about that too much. I think what, what the jury will look at, if we have to take eligibility to them, what we'll look at is, are you a Sunday painter? Are you strictly an amateur artist? And the only time you've sold has been to your family. Um, it's it's really whether you're dedicated to being a professional artist and that's evident in your CV and your artist statement. But I don't think there, I mean, we just had this discussion with someone else the other day, you know, Bo Dixon, Rick Fines, there's a few musicians in town, um, maybe some artists who also work as arts administrators, um, as curators, as edu arts educators, there are a few, very few people in town who make their living exclusively um, by their professional arts practice. So we will certainly know and understand that. Don't let it be a barrier to applying. Up, go ahead and apply. You're welcome. Okay, so we're just, we're trying to speak again and, and be welcoming to people who live in our diverse community. Um, I think a lot of people um, don't realize how far an arts council our size can go in helping people um, fill out application forms and determine their eligibility. People might be shy to do uh, ask questions that they want to ask in a forum like this, but you can always call us or email us and, and we'll help you. Um, keep, in, keep in mind that you're, there is no disciplinary limit if you want to work in traditional methods or practices, if you want to work in beading, if you want to work in traditional um, fabric printing, all of those things fall under the broad banner of visual arts and there's really no limits to that kind of work. Um, please go ahead and apply and we'll help you in any way we can. Um, 
we can also help you with other things in, in terms of um, people who are deaf and hard of hearing. We can arrange um, for ALS translation and um, special telephone lines. There's lots of things that, that we can do to support people and we're happy to do that. I think I talked about the first bullet point earlier. These are all pretty straightforward. Is there something new in the chat here? Oh, I don't think so. Um, we've had a couple of questions over the last week um, since we put out the call for grant applications that I wanted to touch on briefly. People were asking if costs for capital equipment are eligible. Um, the answer is no, not really, especially not cameras or computers. Um, if you needed to get something small like a microphone or buy wood, um, you know, for props or something, yes, but significant capital expenditures are not eligible in either program. Uh, you're asking me about support material. Um, yes, there. Th yes, there is, and it's spelled out in the application form. Gabe, I don't know if you can do it off the top of your head. What the formats are for submitting? Uh, there'll be a slide that we'll get to that includes oh, that. Is there another slide? Yeah. Okay, I've forgotten. Um, and then in the chat, Jillian Turnham is asking: Is there a specific form format for submitting a budget? Uh, what if some of the costs are still to be determined? You do need to have the cost determined by the time that you apply. That's really, really important. Um, there isn't a budget form for component one grants, um, the mini grants. Um, is there a form for component two, Gabe? Yeah, yes. component two has a pretty specific budget form. There it's is. about sections and you fill out uh, numbers for specific things. And so the, there's a pretty specific format that, that you'll see on the application form. Uh, the application form is a fillable PDF, so you can do it all right on that form using those numbers for this is meant for production costs, et cetera. I think with the budgets in component two, the one really important thing is that thing that they say to kids in school, explain your work. So if you have a box office amount at $500, then, then tell us so the jury knows that you're thinking of selling tickets, X number of tickets at $5 um, or X number of subscriptions or, or whatever it is. Just explain the numbers. If it's artist fees, explain to us how many artists and how much you're paying them. And if you can, why that amount? Um, is it so many hours? Is it a flat fee? Um, as long as you have confidence that you've negotiated the fee with your colleagues in advance, that's fine. So here are some step-by-step -step, um, instructions on how to complete the application. So they are available on our website. That's the website address. If you can't find it or lose it, you just need to Google us. And you'll find both the guidelines that explain the purpose and the goals and objectives of the program and the eligibility criteria, and you'll find the application forms. So we recommend that your very first step should be to download the fillable PDF onto your desktop, read it all through. We're gonna go into more detail on that in a minute um, and complete the application on the PDF and provide the supplementary documents as explained in our application form. And then you just email the whole PDF to that address, ec3research at gmail.com. Sorry, Gabe, can you go back one? Okay, support materials. Sorry for that. That's okay. Support materials are really, really important. Remember that the 
can't count on the fact that the jury members know each of you individually or are familiar with your work. That might be true of some jurors for some applicants, but you have to work with the idea in your mind that you're um, explaining your work, your practice, your artistic interests, your aesthetic to people who are not already familiar with who you are and your work. So that's why the support material is super important. And it can take some time to get support material ready, especially if you're submitting videos or you want really great shots of your paintings. Um, pay attention to the requested format that you see in the application form and start early. Um, we'll take up to five examples documenting your previous work as email attachments with your proposal. And here's the detailed descriptions in different kinds of work about what the formats are that we can accept. Jennifer, you're asking about the limits of the videos that people submit can submit. There's no limit. You can, you can submit a video as long as you want, but we will give the jury the option of calling it if they don't want to watch a, you know, the whole video. We give that option to the jury. So you can send one in that's half an hour. But when we put it on, the jury may be either convinced or one way or the other after five or 10 minutes and they don't need to see the rest or they don't want to see the rest. If you'd rather put together um, a compilation tape of, of um, outtakes that you think are strong from different works, that's fine too. It's totally up to you. And you can submit materials illustrating your proposed activity if you've been you know, working on a storyboard or um, a, a rough script, you can submit those things. But it's really important to um, list the support materials on the table that's provided in the application so we can be really sure that we've received everything and we will test all the support materials before the jury meets in case there's been a glitch. But um, it's really important to uh, do that little um, list telling us what exactly you've submitted. We've embedded the checklists this time in the grant applications. And I would recommend that you, um, you know, cut and paste the checklist separately at the beginning of your work on the application and make sure you tick off each thing that's required as you get it done and um, download it into the PDF or upload it into the PDF, however you like to say it. So you can see that the component two checklist is longer and a bit more demanding because there is more money and the projects are bigger. Thanks, Gabe. That's our, our timeline. If something happens and we can't announce the results on August 2nd for some reason, we'll get in touch with you. Some of you are old hands at doing these kinds of grant applications. And I know some of you, it'll be the first or only second time that you've done a grant application like this one. So we've put together some tips and tricks um, we've done a number of workshops over the years just on how to do a great grant application. So we've drawn from that workshop experience. And here are our tips and tricks based on artists' experience. This um, exact uh, comment, check the deadline, start early, start earlier, start right now is uh, words of wisdom from Kate Story, who's probably written more grant applications than almost anyone in town. And you're looking at some, um, a really beautiful photographic piece done by Sue Lily Dixon as part of Arts Week Shift last year and a project curated by Hannah Keating called Postcode Tour. And uh, Sue 
works um, a lot in the area of art and dis disability. Uh, Bethany's work, she's a visual artist, is also part of um, last week's, last year's Arts Week shift. It's part of Postcode Tour. So this is about making sure that you read all of the program guidelines, even though they're wordy and boring. Read them through, read them through twice so that you don't kind of get your application done or your artist statement done and then realize, oh my gosh, this is not what they were asking for. Treat it like an exam essay where they used to always tell us, read the whole exam through first and then start answering the questions. Yep, answer the actual questions on the application. Be really specific. Keep in mind that the jury doesn't know what's going on in your head. They haven't heard about this project before. They're really trying to imagine and visualize what you're going to do based on the words that you put on the paper, on the PDF and the words that you, um, and the support material that you submit. This is a, a project, um, an Arts Week project that Wendy Trussler did. Um, and you can, you can, she's um, wood burning. I think it's actually, <laughs> her CV into a big log of wood. And she planted herself outside the silver bean for several hours every day and continued doing that on pieces of wood until she had uh, the whole CV done. Yeah, this is a really important one because you'll frustrate yourself. Write the drafts of your answers to the questions just on a Word document first. Um, so that you can spell check, you can move things around easily, um, you can send it to a friend or a colleague who might double check everything for you. Don't be shy to do that. We never hand in anything without having Gabe and I read it, the chair of our board reads it, we sometimes get, you know, other board members to read it. Don't be shocked if you seem to be having to write a lot of drafts, it's totally normal and it's worth it. Uh, this is Benedict, Benedict Badukian, and I'm not sure who the other dancer is. Anybody know? That's terrible. Uh, Sorry about what happened at the mall was a fantastic dance piece by Kate Story and uh, Ryan Kerr that was in the Peterborough Square in Arts Week 2018. Yeah, I think you're right. It might be Jen Cole. Thanks, Jennifer. The word counts do matter. Um, so that's another reason why we suggest you do your first draft of things outside of the PDF, and then you can just go through it, but use that tool and look at your word count. Um, when you've got the copy that you like, that you think the draft is good, then you can save it, you can print it out, and you can drop it into the PDF. Our word counts are more generous than most arts councils because I don't really like word counts and we pay our jurors so we don't mind asking them to read a little bit more. I sometimes worry that great work is going unmade because people can't write short things. So we'd rather ask the jury read a little bit more, but the word counts that there that are there are serious. This is a takeout poetry cart. Um, where you can uh, pick topics from the menu of the poetry cart and living artists right before your eyes will write you a poem. This is Sean um, reading outside in the back of the Theatre on King. This was a COVID-19 special. It was part of Arts Week shift uh, in 2020 reading spoken word poetry from his cell phone. Be clear, be concise, avoid jargon and art speak. So I think especially sometimes when artists are applying to an arts council for the first time, they might have a tendency to use art speak or the jargon in the last catalog that they read or the last you know, critical text that they read. 
Um, that usually doesn't go over that well or persuade a jury. Ordinary language that's intelligent, thoughtful, and clear where they can hear the authentic voice of the artist is always the most persuasive. Thanks, Gabe. I'm just gonna check the chat room. Oh, I think I answered Heidi, okay. Yep, get help, get feedback, absolutely get someone to proofread and double check the checklist for you. Uh, this photo is uh, Muriel Mountain, probably with, there with Hank Fisher, and uh, that's from Portrapalooza in Arts Week 2016. That's where they curate um, a program of, I don't know, probably 25 or 30 artists playing music on different people's front verandas. Just uh, don't be embarrassed. It's always better to get feedback from the outside and know and feel confident in the application when you hand it in, um, than be shy and not ask someone else to, to, to take a look at it for you. Listen to what they say. Um, remember that they're in a position similar to the jury in that they're not in your head, they're an outsider, so they can help you. Um, be clear about what you want to do. Oh, this is an old one. This is a sculpture that Let Architects did over Jackson Creek downtown outside their uh, old office in 2015. It was a beautiful project. Try not to be afraid of the budget. Um, you can always connect with Gabe if you're having trouble with your budget. Do be precise. As I said, explain your work or show your work, show us why you got those numbers, what, what went into putting that number on that line, if it's, a, if it's at all vague. Um, you can uh, charge for your project and you can take donations for your project. Unlike for Arts Week projects, this is your project. Thanks, Gabe. Ah, this is really important. Be forthright and honest. Don't pad your budget. Don't make claims or promises you can't meet. And don't underestimate the time and resource requirements that your document needs or that your project need, needs. Remember that you're gonna be being reviewed and assessed by other artists and nobody can smell a padded budget or overdriven claims more than one of your peers. They've been there. Well, I don't know. Somebody in town did this project for Arts Week in 2018 called The Flying Canoe, which was absolutely spectacular. And the shot that you see here is uh, people up in the ceiling at the Canoe Museum. And it's uh, Jennifer Elchuk's project. That's why I'm making a joke. because She's here with us tonight. And just in case, you know, we haven't emphasized it enough, start early so you have time at the end to double check the application for completeness and consistency. Does your budget balance? Does your budget match your narrative? Is there a single story here that the jury can wrap their heads around? Have you used the checklist and made sure you've provided all the documents and pieces of information required? Is the information accurate and up to date? So sometimes we see things where people have accidentally submitted an older video, but told us that it's a newer video and then that, that can fluster a jury. Um, just take your time, make sure you're consistent. So when you're telling the story of what you wanna do, make sure the story is consistent. When you make your artist statement in component two, make sure that it makes sense and lines up with your budget. This was a project called Imaginarium um, from Lester Alfonso, L.A. Lafonso, that was projected from the inside at the Peterborough Public Library during Arts Week. Um, and this is just to remind you to apply for the right component. So if you're looking for a mini grant that's going to be an investment in your personal development and your 
development of your practice and it's kind of wide open and experimentation, research, investigation, time to work on your work is what you want to do. That's the one to apply for. If right now what you're trying to do is put together money for a project, either one around 3,500 or a larger project where you have other funders, then um, I'll, Nicole, I'll get to you in just a second. Then you want to apply for comp component two. It's a little bit tough if you've applied to the Ontario Arts Council for other money for the project if the deadlines and the announcements don't line up because um, we don't have any special privileges with the OAC. They won't let us know how you've done in a competition before they let you know. So you can put in that you've applied for a grant, um, but it would ha have to, the jury would have to think about the fact that you may or may not get the grant and whether or not they have confidence in the project. Um, and if they're worried that you might not get the grant, that could impact their decision making. Uh, sorry, Nicole, I'm just going to drop in here and see what your question was. You have five new messages now. I'll read out the question just so everyone can hear. Thanks, Gabe. Um, for component one, Nicole Malbofax, for component one, if we are seeking out mentorship, coaching, or teaching, uh, sorry, coaching or technology slash technicians to aid in artistic development, do the sports need to be sourced from the Peterborough area? No, they don't. They don't. You just have to argue a case for why you want those people. And we've certainly in the last go round under the banner of Arts Week Shift 2, uh, given grants to people who very specifically needed and wanted to work with people in Toronto or Montreal. If that is not a problem. Are there other questions, Gabe? Uh, none at this time. Okay, good. Okay. Well, I see here Justin Million in a backyard reading that was part of the COVID uh, Arts Week shift. And I think he might be with Ziza Von B and John Hederwick. And that makes me think it was a spoken word event. Didn't we do something like auction these off or something? I sort of forget. Yeah, there was a public raffle to, to get a spoken word reading in your backyard. That's right. Because venues did not exist. So we we're making it up. <laughs> or might have been contaminated. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of our PowerPoint presentation. It will be available. Um, as part of the recording of this workshop on our website. But I'm still open for questions. If anybody else has a question or anxiety, anything we can do to make your application process easier, we're happy to do, do that. Uh, so we've got a question from uh, Sed Judui uh, for component two in terms of creating an event. What would count as an example of previous work? Um, a video would would be good if you have that. If you have a photographic documentation, if you have a audio recording, um, if you have um, a report from a newspaper, um, anything that would help the jury understand what you've done in the past. But we will, ex you know, if you will accept um, support material from works in progress. So if you don't have anything like that, but you wanna make a little video of a work in progress or a recent work and submit it, that's certainly eligible too. And uh, Nicole Malbuff asks, I'm sorry if you answered this already, how many grants are you honoring? Well, we can't tell you that. Nope. That's for the jury to decide. Ha ha, Nicole. <laughs> Jennifer, you and I were trying to connect with each other on the phone today about insurance. Um, and this has been an issue with Arts Week as well. In the last two years, the insurance companies have tightened up so much on insurance for these kind of events. Um, 
Our, we do have $5 million coverage for Arts Week because we need to have that as a baseline to, for us to get any money from anybody, but it only covers EC3. So the way it's been explained to me is, and I do use some of your work as an example, if somebody falls from um, one of your pieces or from one of Nicole's pieces or different dance pieces that we've done and um, hurts themselves, EC3 is protected. Our insurance would cover that, but if they hit someone else and they sue you, you're not covered. We can't cover you, that's the problem. Nor at the moment can we buy riders which we would be prepared to do. But at the moment, the insurance company that we have says that they won't issue riders. Like four years ago, we would just buy event riders, you know, for 300 bucks. We are, one of our board members are investigating other insurance companies. Um, and I have a call into Wendy Trussler from um, Public Art at the city because they require anybody who gets a public art grant that's gonna be doing things in, in public spaces to get um, general um, commercial insurance, but I'm not sure how that's actually happening, how people are managing to do that. Because 5 million, is it's fairly expensive. Jillian's asking a question. Yeah, so we've got two questions actually. Let's start with Jennifer, I'll check. Component two says it must be presented in the next two years. Is that August 2024 or when specifically? Anytime, anytime in uh, 2024, by the end of 2024. And then Jillian Turnham asks, your website said that for Pomona 2, you don't need to have a venue locked down yet for the final output. If your venue is speculative, how would you approach that in your budget? Just put a guesstimated cost of the venue and, and explain. Jillian, are you thinking that it might be in a theater or something? For pop-ups, she's saying. Oh, pop-ups. Yeah. Yeah, so put as much detail as you can. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is, in component two, there's a section to, to discuss your, your location or venue as well in the application form. So you could also discuss, the, discuss it there as well. If your work is site specific and it's really important that you have the work presented in a particular site, just describe why. Yeah. If anyone wants to, to pop up with a question as well, uh, um, just, just, you can also just uh, turn on your mic and, and ask it at this point as well. Um, you don't want to j dive into chat. Jillian, did we answer all your questions? You can just nod. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, I'm, I haven't written a budget before, so I might need to reach out for some specific help with that. I think I'm looking earnestly at Nicole when I'm trying to talk to Jillian. I'm really sorry about that. It's the ins and outs. Well, of hey, Nicole, your hair is longer, right? Okay, I don't feel so bad then. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the uh, the email address is is on our website and on the application form and all that, which is my email address, ec3.research at gmail.com. Uh, you can also email Sue Dida as well, sue.dida at sabbatico.ca. Um, if you got any questions, feel free to reach out. We're, we're here to Where's help. Where's Jillian? Yeah, we're here to help out to make this as easy as possible. Yeah, I mean, don't consider this workshop the, the end of the story or the end of the information or questions. We're really, really open to talking to people. If you have a panic attack in the middle of your grant application form, don't worry. Lots of people do, but don't give up. Just call us. Mm -hmm. We'll talk you through it. Yeah. And this, I would say, like, this kind of grant is, is the specific kind of thing that often appeals to a lot of that, that works for, for some first time applicants some people who, who may be new to the granting process. So we very much understand that. And there's no dumb questions. <laughs> I'm very experienced and I have at least three panic attacks a day and Gabe talks me down. Do what I can. All righty. 
I think that's it from our end. If there are no other questions, we'll wrap up and say good night and good luck. And we really hope all of you apply and anything that you need to support your application, please email us or call us. We'll be happy to help in any way that we can. The more robust the competition, and it is a competition, unfortunately, the better for all of us in the in the long run, um, because that's how we'll get more money to have a bigger and better grant program in the future. Um, we we are starting to get inquiries from a municipal candidates and candidates for mayor, and we've made it very clear to everybody that we've talked to so far that getting this program approved as a permanent program and guaranteeing regular increases in it. I mean, we'd have to talk about how that goes, whether it's indexed to inflation or whatever the tax rate increase was, is, is an absolute top priority for the community. Um, and for EC3, we are strong believers that art comes from artists. It doesn't come from theaters or it doesn't come from marketing people. It doesn't come from executive directors. It comes from artists. So we consider it absolutely top priority and a clear mission to support and sustain individual artists in any way that we can. And we'll be bugging the city to do that as well. All right, people, good luck with everything. Happy summer solstice, happy Indigenous People's Day. Take care of yourselves. There's still a bit of COVID out there and uh, be in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Oh, I forget.